Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Voice of Adoptees, which brings together diverse and unique voices from around the world to share their stories. If you liked today's episode, remember to give us a like, subscribe, and leave a review. Here's your host, David Shunk. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Voice of Adoptees. I am your host, David. Today, I'm here with Lori. She is a business owner, an author, an adoptee, and an adoptive parent. Welcome, Lori. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Really appreciate it. Will you please tell our listeners about yourself, where you're from, where you're adopted from, and a fun fact about you? Happy to. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, So I'm a domestic baby scoop era adoptee. I was roughly six weeks old in a Catholic charities facility. I can only guess that is a fact, but I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah. My Adoptive parents were older, unable to conceive, and story they told me was very lovely that, of course, my my birth parents were, you know, in college and just unable to care for me, but in love and all of that. And, of course, we later find out that none of that's true, <laughs> but made for a, a lovely narrative until I was in my 20s. And they moved immediately to the Bay Area. My dad was in in sales and uh, and had been transferred right away. So I didn't spend any time in Utah except for that first six weeks. So I had a very lovely upbringing. My parents were amazing people. They both since passed. My mom died when I was 16. So that was hard. And my dad lived a long life uh, to 91. So always felt loved and supported. I was raised an only child and... You know, they were older, so they had, you know, some disposable income. So I was, you know, we had little vacations, nothing extravagant, but I, I lived a, a nice uh, life. I grew up in mostly in Connecticut. We moved eventually uh, to the East Coast, and that's where my dad stayed. I did not know I was adopted till I was eight. That was a shock. And I, remember that moment that day it was a Saturday it's in the book that I wrote my 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 track my song it was one of those you know up, turn my world upside down mom was like what what do you mean I'm a top my mom did not want to tell me my dad I guess as the story somewhat got told because then of course we never talked about it again <laughs> um or very rarely it was goofy and uncomfortable so you just accepted it and we're grateful and all that, you know, now that I know that that's all very common, but the, I was very inquisitive. So as a, as a child, it turns out I'm very curious as an adult, but I'm like, so mom, why are there no pictures of me until I'm like six weeks old? Mom, how come there's no pictures of you when you're pregnant? Mom, how could, you know, cause all my friends are like, oh, here's my baby picture. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, but much bigger. <laughs> So I think that all of that uh, led them to say, oh, we better tell her because we're going to run out of answers. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just remember that we all sat down. It was a Saturday night. I, you know, I was just devastated. So that probably was the first real identity obliteration that, you know, I experienced as an adoptee and had no construct to fall on that I was going through adoption trauma, which, of course, decades later with the advent and discovery of the brilliant, the primal wound made all the sense in the world. But that was just a year ago that I, you know, became uh, aware of, of this and of adoption trauma. So of course I dove, you know, feet first or head first and learning all I could about that. And then it just made so much sense, you know, all these times in my life where, you know, that was happening. As, as far as my unfolding of the adoption story I, I i was very happy i had great parents so you know maybe there was probably some curiosity you know as i've read adoptees fantasize about their families and that kind of thing my fantasy was that my dad was actually my dad because i kind of looked like him we were both double jointed we had you know had similar features you know i, I fit right into my family no one ever questioned it you know and have friends you don't look adopted i'm like oh, yeah i can relate to her and her upbringing well so it's very similar you know but i also dreamed i had lots of uh, siblings so 
you know, like the Partridge family back in my day was a big deal. Well, I, of course, was a member of that family. And then there was eight is enough. And I was always attracted to friends who had large families, you know, and I was so fascinated with genetics, which, of course, that term wasn't even necessarily used at the time, but that they all looked alike. You know, like there were certain families that you went to school with that they all looked alike. And you're like, oh, yeah, you must be an, an Irwin or a Cassane or whatever, because they all just had such similarity. So that I was always fascinated with, like, oh, what would it be like to look like somebody? Right. I mean, I know we we all go through that. So fast forward into my 20s, I started adulting and getting, setting up doctors and that kind of thing. And then the whole narrative of, so what's your medical history? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, my mother died of a heart attack, but the biology there. So, so I said, okay, well, I was a little curious and decided to try to find out something about my, my origins. And so I wrote to Catholic Charities in Salt Lake. They sent some tiny little paragraph from the social worker that looked like the type font of the 60s. Not a whole lot there. What was uh, shared was that uh, the birth mother was 19. She wanted to keep me, but her mother was basically like, yeah, hell no. <laughs> and it was forced to, a little alliteration there, uh, and was pretty much forced to, to give me up. So I'm quite certain that that was a hugely traumatic experience for her. And though, and I later ended up getting connected to her through Ancestry, and that was in about 2017. But let me back up a little bit. So I did, uh, again, as I mentioned, reach out. The birth father didn't know about me, which was news because, you know, my lovely, you know, Pollyanna story my parents told me is that they were married and in college. And, but no, the birth father did not know about me. He was, supposedly 20 and in the service of some sort. And the the birth grandmother, maternal grandmother did not approve. So that was all that was written there. So I kind of let that go. I was like, well, he didn't know about me. I'll never know about him. So it goes. But I was always curious if I had siblings because I was raised an only child and you know, I always wanted a brother or something. And so that was certainly curious. You know, if my birth mother was indeed 19 when she had me, then the likelihood that maybe she had other children, possibly. So I kind of let that go a little bit. And fast forward, you know, in my own journey, I tried to have children and wasn't able to. And my husband at the time was like, we should adopt, we should adopt. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> I was not for it. I did not think that was a good idea. I didn't know why, but I just, I, I really was resisting I'm also very spiritual, so I, I believe in signs and, and angels and all that. And I was, had a barrage of signs that I needed to be thinking about adoption. You know, adopt. the highway signs were showing up where I never saw them before. Everybody's like, oh, it up me. oh, you know, and then finally my roommate from college who I adore and we would talk to each other on, on our commute said, oh, you know, one of our classmates just adopted. And I, I was 40 two at this point in time. And I'm like, that's crazy. Well, then I realized, all right, I'm supposed to adopt. My mom was 43 when she adopted me. And I was 43 when I got Kate and I named her after my mom. And five months after I finally said, yeah, I should adopt. She was, uh, we got the call and her birth mom had some special needs challenges and, and really was unable to care for did, didn't even know she was pregnant actually so yeah we do feel of course blessed that we found each other we have a great relationship in fact she and I both went to untangling your roots in Denver this last year she's 17 now and I asked her do you want to go and we can learn together and it was really quite a special experience for for us so I started to then be curious about ancestry and all the DNA things were can't even remember the name of the first one I did because I was curious about her her heritage as well because I wanted to honor if there was you know some 
you know, cultural heritage that would be wonderful for her to be embracing. So that was a nice clue. Turns out she is um, half indigenous. So uh, uh, from a, a, a tribe in uh, Chile. So I've tried over the years. I could have done a better job, but we talk about it and she, she knows and has some, some pride about that. Yeah. So then I met another, I started all of a sudden meeting adoptees and this is about five years ago. And I ran into this woman, Sharon, she turns out she was adopted as a neighbor. I had no idea. We ended up chatting about it. I'm like, this is an amazing story. And that was the epiphany that I, I should write book about all these stories. So Adoption Songs was born then. People cho choose a song that resonates with their journey and their story. And that's the title of their their chapter. So that's why Adoption Songs, but it's heartwarming and heartbreaking narratives from the many sides of adoption. So we've got adoptees, adopted parents, we've got, you know, DNA, um, discovery, birth, uh, or um, siblings. So we tried to capture some of the constellation, I wasn't able to secure a birth mom, um, although I did end up chatting with a birth mom of one of the adoptees that's in the story. And she shared a lot about her trauma and, you know, the girls who went away, you know, Ann Fessler. I mean, that, that was absolutely her experience. And, you know, so just learning so much about the complexity of the constellation and what people go through and so I did end up finding birth father family, which was a shock because, of course, the birth father, you know, didn't know about me. And that, that part was true. He was not 19 or 20. He was 35 and had a family. So not sure that that story is probably he was he was dead by the time I, I found the family. But a cousin, first cousin is the one who figured it out. Her mom, his mom, Aunt Barb, she's uh, featured in, in my in my track. I have, I have an aunt Barb too. I mean, that's great. Yeah. She was hilarious and she, she passed a couple of years after I found her, but we talked a lot. She wrote me this beautiful poem that I, I have in the book. And so that was really, really cool. I'm, I'm somewhat in touch with the, with my cousin who'd figured it all out, but you know, we went down and, and met met that part of the family. I did find a half sister that we share birth father. He relinquished her at birth and we were in reunion for about five years. And then I went through a lot. I went through a divorce and selling my home and a lot of upheaval. And, and I think that was, I was a little much for her probably. So she was very brave and said that she couldn't be in relationship with me anymore. So I had to respect that that was her boundaries and you know i wish her well but yeah that was sad because i was excited to have an older sister and and, and have some family but I, I treasure that i do have that experience and i didn't get to ex i did get to connect with someone who did look like me and it's okay you know everybody's got their story the birth mother did she give like a did she give a reason why it was too much or was, was it just too emotional for her to keep a relationship? I, I think because well, I'm very extroverted and I overshare and she, she was much more quiet and reserved. And I, I just think I was a little too much energy for her. And that's fair. You were, you, to, you said that, you know, you didn't find out that you were adopted until eight years old. And I guess my question is, why do you think, I mean, do you know why your parents kept that information for eight years? Did they ever justify their reasoning or do you, do you know why, I guess? Yeah. My mom adored me. I mean, we would joke around and, you know, escalate how much we loved one another and it would end with, I idolized you, was her to me. She wanted me to be hers. She just, she loved me so much. And I get that because I feel the same with, with Kate. So I understand that, that love. And, and she, back in the, I guess it would be the seventies by the time they told me, you know, adoption wasn't talked about. I mean, it was on the down low for sure. And I didn't know anybody else adopted and, and we had moved so that, you know, we were in an area where we didn't know anybody. We didn't have any family around. So there wasn't any potential family to be like, whoops, slipped out. 
So I think, you know, their secret was safe. But again, with my curiosity, my mother was and father chronicled everything. They had a video camera. I mean, every, every moment of my life that didn't start until six weeks after I was born. So, you know, it's, oh, well, we just didn't have a camera yet. Okay. You know, so, um, <laughs> yeah. She, was, yeah. she wanted me to be hers and she didn't want me to ever feel bad about it. You know, and of course it backfired and then I didn't trust her. And then I found out a few years later that she lied about her age. She was actually, she did, said she was born the same year as my dad. You know, she was March, my dad was July. Well, it turned out she was nine years older than my dad. And I discovered that visiting a grandfather and he had a family Bible with all the, you know, children and their birth dates. I'm like, why wouldn't they have the wrong birthday in the Bible, Mom? <laughs> Oops. So bless her heart. Kind, wonderful woman. But she had her own trauma, as we all we all do, that she was overcoming. She was the youngest of four, grew up in the Depression. Her father was a bootlegger. You know, I mean, it was tough times. And she didn't want me ever to, both of them, they were both Depression era. They wanted me to have the best of everything, you know, and, and I appreciate that because I, I was given opportunities they didn't have. I wasn't yeah. spoiled in, in a materialistic way necessarily, but I was spoiled in love and acceptance, uh, which I think served me well. I did grow up, you know, confident in my own way, at least on the outside. And But there was always, I definitely had the stuff inside that I didn't belong and I didn't fit in. And, you know, I was fairly active and involved in high school, but I floated around to groups because I just never felt like I connected with anybody. And I, you know, I thought that was weird, but I, you know, I didn't have, again, I didn't have the construct of, of belonging and adoption trauma. I mean, for sure I was taken from my birth mother and given to perfect strangers. You know, I was the typical, you know, birth adoptee and, that you know so it helped i mean that was hugely helpful i'm also an executive coach so i've been doing a lot of of inward work uh, self-awareness self-management lots of lots of self-discovery anyway throughout my my life and my career so i'm glad i had all of that to support me as i did discover what was the crux of all of these weird feelings i never could identify, but at least I had some techniques uh, and strategies to keep above the waterline. Because, you know, I, I of course I'm very active now, learning and meeting people on Insta, and you know, there's a lot of very angry adoptees out there, and I appreciate and empathize with what they've learned. And and I and there's also adoptees out there that have had horrible experiences. In fact, I have one comment on a post I did on TikTok that, you know, her father, her brother, her uh, adoptive father is a pedophile. And I'm like, it, what do you, there's no excuse I've, for I, that. I've, I've right? learned throughout different social platforms. I'd say TikTok is the one that has the most negative opinions that I think I've come across and it's unfortunate, but you know, I mean, you said, it, you know, just what you said, I mean, adoption, there are some people who have positive stories and there are some people who have, you know, negative stories, but you have to respect horrible, horrible their, uh, yeah. And you know, you, you can't, their, their lived experience matters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Their experience is equally as important as anyone else's. So it's just a shame to hear it. But. Well, and never mind international adoptions. I mean, I've heard horror stories. I'm sure you have too. And God, I hope you weren't a victim of one of them, but yeah, so that that I, I touch on that a little bit in one of the the tracks. Uh, a friend of mine adopted internationally and wasn't good, but they found out. Yeah, so I I think where I'm I'm hoping in all of this that with the background that I do have and really helping and supporting people to create a better future for themselves, that I can take that and how I used it in in a corporate setting and. You know, of course, I'm no therapist, so I'm never going to be qualified to be one. But 
you know, I think if people are really ready to, you know, get out of that fog and, you know, create that new playlist for their life and, and, and want to stay above that waterline, cause it's so easy to sink down into dark, deep depression and who am I? No one loves me. You know, I, I kind of refuse to let myself go there. I let myself go dip down a little because I really, I have really no family now. I have some step family who have been trying to make me still feel a part of a part of their center of family, but truly I am an outsider and, you know, they're kind enough. And so I think a lot of us struggle with that, you know, like, and, and I think those who were able to physically give birth and have family and, you know, get that DNA connection, cause that's really strong. I mean, that's your tribe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you ever feel like uh, you mentioned that you you know as an outsider? Do you think that adoption is like the I guess sole reason that you feel like an outsider, or do you think that it's the way you were raised or who you surround yourself with? Um, I'm just curious because you know I mean I guess most adoptees you know we are outsiders in a lot of ways because we, you know, we didn't come from that family. We got adopted into that family, but you know, the, the way that you're raised and everything can really have a large impact on your experience and everything. So I'm just curious of like, you know, curious what your opinions are about that. Yeah. And I, and I'm sure it's another complex question, right? I mean, like I said, my, I didn't have, other my my mother dying was trauma for sure because that and I didn't realize this but then I lost two mothers I lost my birth mother and then I lost my adoptive mother by the time I'm 16 and then truly I was on my own I mean my dad was basically he remarried right away and we went off to college and there was never an opportunity to connect that family yeah. he's like go go live your life work do your career i'm proud of you you're awesome you can do this so and back yeah. in the 80s i mean you just went and yeah you know, got a job and started your own family so yeah i mean I, of course of course your life ex like experiences are are going to create that lack of belonging or identity and and then of course, you know you hear this all the time from people that are not adopted that you know everybody's got trauma and of course that's true and i think we've got a very different unique condition that's in in our tissues yeah that we didn't ask for you know i mean it, it, there's thank goodness so much evidence that says that of course nonverbal infants can recognize that they're not with their birth moms and they're looking around going what where am I what's going on so you're in fight or flight you've got cortisol shooting through your body from from the beginning never mind the cortisol the birth mother is probably infusing into the fetus through her genetic you know, pregnancy, especially if, you right. know, the base, the vera, you know, the shame, all of that. You know, you mentioned before we were talking about the culture in, in Russia and, and the shame and it, yep. ba it yeah. innocent babies should not have to be bathing in shame. I mean, it's, it's yeah, just, they, they shouldn't be, they, you know, we definitely shouldn't be labeled as the victims because we are just a result of what happened pretty much. <laughs> and so many people, cause I'm, I'm feeling called to help the mainstream see things a little differently. Cause I, 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 I absolutely after, right. You got the, Oh, adoption's beautiful and lovely. And you know, you should be grateful. And thank you, Angela Tucker for a great book entitled just that. And then there's the angry adoptees that are, you know, just, killing it for reform which i but which i agree there needs to be reform do i think abolishing adoption is going to solve it or that it's possible i personally do not think that it's probably going to get abolished should it be yeah should adoptive parents be well informed and should adoptees be getting therapy immediately absolutely you know, and I don't know if that'll solve it all either, but, you know, I, I talk to adoptive parents where they're like, yeah, you know, my son, my daughter, you know, they're, they're 
they were great. And then all of a sudden, you know, they got in their teen years or early twenties and this tumult started. It's, that's, that's the drama coming out and you can't ignore that. Right. So I, I just hope that I can help kind of that mainstream know that it's a little more, you know, we don't get birth certificates. We don't get history. Yeah. We don't, get, you know, the, 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 the verbal narrative of, you know, hundreds of years of your, you know, your background. And even though, even if your background's bad and you don't get along with your family, you're still biologically connected to them. Yeah. I, I just think, I think at the bare minimum, I'm at least, you know, at least we should be able to get medical history. I mean, the fact that some of us, like I was talking to you before uh, the, the interview, this interview, getting adopted to the U.S. and having made up medical history. I mean, that's that's just kind of disgusting, if you ask me. Like, what what government would just allow that to just fake a bunch of stuff on? I mean, come on. Like, I didn't even know my own, like, blood type until three years ago when I was in the hospital for an injury. Like, I mean... The fact that you just don't know like basic human things, I feel is just, I think it's wrong. It's, it's like criminal in my opinion. <laughs> well, it is David. I mean, your, your story, I had no idea that those, you know, practices were happening. So thank you for enlightening me to that, but talk about unethical. I mean, you're entering the world in an unethical environment with people who think that that's okay. Cause they've been doing it all along. Well, this is how we move the babies out. Oh my gosh. Right. So, yeah. you know, yeah. bless you for those beginnings. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, it was always, you know, it's always been a pain because since I reconnected with my biological family before that, every single doctor, every, you know, eye exam, orthodontist, dentist, whatever, whenever they ask, you know, what's your medic, what's your family medical history? You have to say, I don't know. <laughs> and that that's just, that you know, I know, it sucks. That's pretty much the only way to say it. Like, you don't know. It's just. Yeah. And I, I didn't realize how much it sucked until I started doing it with my daughter. Right. Because it's like, oh, God, you have this, too. We don't know. She's adopted. Well, what's your background? I don't know. I'm adopted. <laughs> 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 we, have, we have like generations of unknown here. So. Yeah. Well, and interestingly, we did discover, because I think like 23andMe was kind of a cool test in that they had the 84, 86 disease states if you're genetically predisposed. So that was very helpful. I think technology yeah. is, you know, being a little useful when it comes to that. You know, having all your DNA out for the world to find is scary, but too late and already out there. You know, but my daughter, so since her birth mom you know, had some special needs issues. She didn't know she was pregnant. There was no prenatal care. Now she was oh. teeny tiny when she was born, but caught up and, and was really healthy. I mean, we were very, very lucky. However, she does, she had these growing pains all the time. And I'm like, oh, they're just growing pain. You know, hips, joints, knees, ankles, you know, and I, I didn't give it a lot of thought. And, you know, I, after all, it would go away and she'd stop complaining about it. And then, of course, I'm busy and distracted. Well, it turns out this past year, finally, I'm like, all right, well, go take you to the to the orthopod and we'll find out. Well, he came up with a fabulous theory that no one, and it made total sense. He's like, well, there's no prenatal care. She probably had issues with her cartilage, you know, being fully formed and developed. So, and I'm like... That that makes total sense. Not a lot to do about it other than exercises and you know, but that she's probably gonna have, you know, some some challenges over time with, with that. But yeah, that that's an interesting thing that I guess we kind of knew, but you know, it, it does have that with those health impacts. Right. Um, uh, do you think that being an adopted parent now, you think that helped and so because you, uh, you know, first off, you were adoptee. So, do you think that helped in terms of when you adopted a child, connect in some ways that 
others, I guess, couldn't just because you know what it's like to be an adoptee. So did that have any effect with um, your child when you adopted them? So I think certainly I can only speak for, for my experience in that. It's sure I, there were things about my adoption that I wanted to make sure were better for, for her, which number one was knowing your adoption. <laughs> so she's just known all her life. I was lucky enough to not going to wait eight years. Yeah. Uh, and I was lucky enough to have a picture of her birth mom giving her to me. So she actually can see what her birth mom looked like. And and we go through that book. Well, not now that she's 17, but we go through that book every birthday and kind of honor that heritage and, you know, talk about her being a Mapuche and all of that. So I, I think that, yes, then that did help me at least for her. So there was no big giant surprise. I also knew a little bit about the birth father. You know, she has a half brother from a previous pregnancy that also was given up for adoption. So I, I was trying to figure out what's the age appropriate time to tell her these things because I didn't I didn't want to wait till she's 21 and then be like what I have a half brother why don't you tell me so I, I probably maybe told her a little too soon but we're very very close we talk about everything we're you know we're very very connected you know I, I think she would say the same but I I won't speak for her so I think I made the right call and just being really transparent as much as I could. And then of course, as I started to learn the wound and all of that, I said, Hey, I'm, I'm learning some things to, you know, you let me know how much you want to know. And if it's too much, then just tell me. And back when we went to, the, you know, untangling our, our roots out in Denver, she was all in that first day. And then she was so exhausted. I mean, we all work. This is very emotional. And she goes, yeah. mom, can I take the day off today? But Gosh, of course you can. <laughs> you know? And everyone was just lovely. And she was clearly the youngest person out of the, you know, 300 people or whatever that was there. And but it was nice because she she made her own little connections and made, met some people. And, and it was fabulous. That's awesome. Let's talk about your book a little bit. Besides being adopted, what were some other inspirations that wanted you to, I guess, author a book? Yeah. Well, I think I was fortunate enough to have a great career at Procter & Gamble. So, you know, messaging and kind of packaging and putting things together was a skill that I had. So I, I had fun on the creative side of, of being able to tell these stories. And also my, my, my stepdaughter is a trained editor and she wrote, you know, a lot of the stories I would interview, you know, just record it on Zoom, <clears throat> get a transcript. And then Lexi was able to to turn a lot of them into, you know, beautiful stories. And so I think being able to weave in, you know, one family was definitely a family project. Kate, the book she helped with, and she's an artist too, and musical, and she's very musical. I was musical so that the music theme was just obvious to us. And then I don't know if you can see it, but here's our little bookmark. It's our playlist. And these are all the... Oh, that's so cool. Movies. And then their song that they chose. So we've got, you know, I Won't Give Up, Fire and Rain, They Need Me Rhapsody, that Take You Into the Streets. That's the line, you know, you don't know me, but I'm your brother. <laughs> Surprise. Um, it's been that one too. So, you know, I, I, I think that the healing universal power of music is something that it, it can be really helpful in people's healing journey. So part of what's come out of this, and, and I don't know if it'll work, but we'll try, is being able to offer, you know, adoptees who really want to accelerate their their healing path, right? Because doing it alone sucks. Uh, yeah. And I think there's so many of us out there that want to be a resource and help one, and it helps us too. Every time I hear someone's story, just like you sharing with me this morning was beautiful and very helpful. So I, yeah, I, I, I think that the, I think my audience is kind of the mainstream. I don't think adoptees necessarily, although I think there's probably some acknowledgement and reading other people's stories and seeing, you know, what they went through, you know, but I, I hope that I can open some eyes so that people aren't naive that it's all roses and sunshine because it's not right you know 
in my little line initiative was, well, yeah, adoption can be beautiful, but there's more. It's a, yeah, it's a big topic that I feel people don't know how to talk about unless you are inside and we even don't know how to talk about it half the time. So I, it's like, it's relatively new. I mean, I think the best way to put it is I, I, I interviewed someone a couple of weeks ago and he told me, you know, he was adopted from a different era where no one talked about adoption. You know, it was something that you just didn't have a conversation about. And now, you know, here we are after 2020 and feels like all the all the adults from the 80s 70s 90s era they're all coming out now and finally acknowledging it and like really thinking about it because it's something that it's it's who we are as people and but it's 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 complicated in a way where only i guess we understand and we're trying to learn from each other and, and the best way to do that is to start a conversation so you you authored a book and I I wrote kind of a part one of my story as well. I have it out there as well. Kind of like a little about myself and my trip back to Russia and all that. But um, I'm still working on my part two. But it's it's just, it, it's even for me, it's hard to just, you know, write your thoughts down about what I think about adoption because it's just so, it's, it's, it's like a daunting, it's a daunting topic. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I always applaud people that write about right. it and yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and and there's just so many, you know, the I'm gonna say it wrong, but the harass retreat group that that I guess there's you know, different three, five, seven day retreats for adoptees. So at least there's resources now. Yeah. So now that the cat's out of the bag, so to speak, lots of people who want to help are are available out there you know i mean the, the folks from adoption unfiltered you know Lori holden and you know there's uh you know just a, a host of really strong qualified you know experts that are out there really doing great work and your your group included with this podcast uh you know that, that the people can find their voice that's the whole yeah the that's why I started it. I mean, the whole, the whole reason behind it was just to have a safe place for people to just tell their story. And, you know, I've, we've only been doing it for over a little, you know, a year and a couple months. And oh, it's crazy because I've talked to, I've interviewed a lot of people who said after like an interview, like, wow, like it was the first time that they ever actually like sat down and thought about their adoption and talked about it and it's crazy because like just you know it's something that we don't do i guess every you know we don't i mean this is just me personally you know i, I don't obsess about it all the time there are some people who unfortunately you know they they did have a traumatic experience from adoption so it's going to be on their mind a lot more but i mean it the whole reason behind this podcast was just well, the name kind of says it all, Voice of Adoptees, like, just talk <laughs> and tell, tell us your story, whatever you want, you know, a non-judgmental space, just share what you want. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing that and providing that space for, for people. It's really important. And, and people need to feel safe. And I think that, you know, because we are unique and we've had these experiences that a lot of people are like, really? What? I, I don't see that. No, you know, we, we can't really talk to, you know, I've got lovely friends who adore me, but they're, they're never going to understand. So these new adoptees I've met uh, recently, <gasps> it's just so wonderful because we just have to look at each other. We're like, yeah, I get it. It's, it's beautiful, right? spoken language that we instantly can feel one another and it's pretty powerful yeah it's it's hard when we yeah experience things like you know when you know if, I, if some, you know for example my biological mother calls me and it irritates me and i want to vent to someone about it and they just look at me and they have no idea like they're like okay well that you know that sucks but you talk to someone who's adopted they're they're like oh yeah no I get it. <laughs> well, and she had her own trauma that 
And you, who knows? My God, I can't even imagine what it's like to be a woman who's given up their child in Russia. That cannot be a, a, a good day for her. No. No, definitely not. So my final question for you is, and this is a big one, what piece of advice can you leave for our listeners and for the adoption community? What piece of advice can you leave from your experiences? What I'm encouraged about is that the therapeutic community is now recognizing that adoption trauma informed is a whole separate field of study. Uh, I think we're going to start seeing far more therapists out there available that are adoption trauma informed. Trauma informed is helpful, but adoption trauma informed whole special subset, uh, subspecialty. So I would just highly recommend that we go get some therapy from an adoption trauma informed therapist because there's no reason to be alone. You know, once you finally do get out of that fog of, you know, fear and obligation and guilt and it's hard. You don't want to be just left without coping skills with all of that emotion and, and confusion. So having someone that really is trained and then finding ways to, it's all down to the neuroscience. I truly believe that we can, you know, our, our brains believe what we tell it. And if we're like, oh, I'm, I'm a very sad adoptee, then you know, we're going to be a very sad adoptee. If we're like, I'm a powerful adoptee, going to get out there and kick ass and help people and, and do something good as a result of this, your brain is going to believe that too. So, you know, as far as habit making and habit breaking, you can't stop a bad habit. You have to create a new one. So you can't stop feeling bad about being a doctor. You have to start finding that gold there. So now get so advice. That that's, that was beautiful. That was really good, really good wisdom and advice. <clears throat> yeah. That, you, you said it perfectly. <laughs> Lori, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me and sharing. Thanks for about... letting me in. Yes, oh, you're fabulous. Of course. And, and uh, you know, let me know how I can support you and the work you're doing because it's really important. Of course. No, absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Welcome you back anytime you want. You want to tell us where we can uh, get your book and order your book? Yep. So Amazon has it. We're in still in that eight week pre-sale period, but on July 9th, it will get shipped. So it's right around the corner. In fact, that's my birthday. I figured that'd be a clever day to birth my book is on my birthday. So I'm big into numbers and connectivity. So um, it's also available. Any of your favorite booksellers, Book Baby is the publisher and they have their own book selling mechanism you can actually get it any day because they've been having it all along but and i would appreciate if anybody feels they know someone that could benefit from learning about these different stories we've got 20 different narratives from a variety of lenses then uh yeah we just really want to help help people you know that's awesome that's awesome well yeah definitely i look forward to reading it i'm definitely going to get a copy myself you know, it would, well, I'll send you one. Just give me an address. Sure, I, I would love a signed copy, absolutely, and I'll and I'll return the favor and send you a signed copy as well. Yeah, good deal. Awesome, perfect. Well, thank Lori, you, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, and thank you to all of our listeners out there. For those who want to hear Lori's story, please visit your podcast platform on our website, voiceofadoptees dot com. If you or someone you know is adopted, you can schedule an interview to be featured on our show. Don't forget to like, subscribe, rate, and share this episode to spread the voice of adoptees and check out and subscribe to our new Patreon page. On behalf of all of us, we thank you for listening. We will see you next week. Voice of Adoptees, who am I? Thanks for listening to Voice of Adoptees. Please take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave a review. See you next time.